Williamsburg City Council and James City County Board of Supervisors. With that meeting of the Williamsburg James City, I call this meeting of the Williamsburg James City County School Board to order. Ms. Dollar, will you take the roll, please? Dr. Kavasos. Present. Ms. Chen. Present. Mrs. Donner. Present. Mr. Hosang. Here. Mr. Riffle. And Mrs. Ortego. Here. Thank you. And can I have a motion to allow Mrs. Hundley to join us via electronic communication? Madam School Board Chair, I move to allow Mrs. Hundley to join us by Zoom. Do I have a second? Dr. Kavasos, thank you. Mrs. Dollar, are you ready? Mrs. Donner. Aye. Mr. Hosang. Aye. Mr. Riffle. Aye. Dr. Kavasos. Aye. Mrs. Chen. Aye. Mrs. Ortego. Aye. Well, yeah, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Stryker Center here in the city of Williamsburg. May I have, let's see, I got to call the roll. Ms. McKay, would you call the roll, please? Mayor Pons. Here. Vice Mayor Dent. Here. Ms. Lindsey. Here. Mr. Rogers. Here. Ms. Perch here. Here. Thank you. Ms. Larson. I call this joint meeting to order for the Board of Supervisors. Mr. Stevens, could you call the roll? Ms. Null. Mr. Hipple. Here. Mr. McLennan. Here. Mr. Eisenhower. Here. Ms. Larson. Here. All right. Well, I will turn it right over to our superintendent, Dr. Aaron, to present the budget. Thank you very much, Judy. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Chair Larson, Board of Supervisors, Mayor Pons, City Council members, and School Board members. This morning, we're delighted to present the budget for the superintendent of the Board of Supervisors, Mr. Stevens. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Heron. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's our pleasure to share with you this morning the superintendent's proposed budget for fiscal year 25. This budget is based on Governor Youngkin's introduced budget for the 24-26 biennium, which provided minimal increased state funding for our division. We do anticipate increased funding based on the General Assembly's budget. As you know, state code requires the superintendent to prepare a needs-based budget to present to the school board for consideration. This is a data-driven estimate of what is required to provide the highest quality education possible to the children of our community. Considerable work has gone into developing the superintendent's proposed budget. This fiscal year 25 plan is a balance of meeting established school board priorities related to the strategic plan, elevate beyond excellence, review of available revenue, and meeting the division needs for the upcoming fiscal year. We are thankful for both the leadership and financial support you have provided to our community and schools, and we look forward to our continued partnership throughout the budget development process. The Local Composite Index, or LCI, is the state's measurement of each locality's ability to pay for public education. The formula takes into consideration the changes in property values and taxes, the local income and retail sales, and compares it to that for the entire state. Each locality's index is adjusted to maintain an overall statewide local share of 45% and an overall state share of 55%. Much of our funding is derived from a per pupil cost multiplied by one minus the composite index. So the lower the composite index results in more state funding, while a higher composite index would result in less state funding. The LCI is supposed to be an indicator of the wealth of the locality. If it goes up, the locality is deemed to have increased wealth and will be able to provide additional funding to support its programs. The LCI is updated at the start of each biennium, and since our school division is in two localities, we have two LCIs, both of which have increased for the new biennium. The city of Williamsburg has changed from 0.7217 to 0.7426, and James City Counties is increasing from 0.5331 to 0.5403 for the 24-26 biennium. This chart shows a comparison of our LCI with divisions here on the peninsula, as well as three of the larger Region 2 divisions on the south side. As you can see, Williamsburg and James City County have the highest LCI of any locality in our area. He is now joining. Unfortunately, that means fewer state dollars for our schools and an increased dependence on our local funding partners. Enrollment is based on our September 30th student count each year. This is a historical look at our enrollment from fiscal year 2016 until now. We had a steady increase in enrollment through fiscal year 2018. Then enrollment leveled off for a couple of years at approximately 11,450 prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. We saw a decline in enrollment in fiscal year 21 to 10,858 due to the pandemic, but we've increased for a couple of years and are now up to 11,324. Each year, FutureThink prepares 10-year enrollment projections based on our September 30th enrollment. These projections include a low, moderate, most likely, and high projection. Next year's projection ranges from a low of 11,224 to a high of 11,537. Over many years, we have used the low projection to develop our operating budget. We have developed the budget again based on our current year enrollment as of September 30th. Enrollment is slowly recovering after the decline due to the pandemic, and we believe the most conservative approach is to budget based on the students that we currently have. As a reminder, these enrollment numbers do not include our preschool students, which are approximately 395. As we shared earlier, our state revenue is based on the governor's introduced budget for the 24-26 biennial budget and is estimated to go up minimally by approximately 112,000. Based on a preliminary estimate provided by the state for the General Assembly's budget, we may see an overall increase in state funding of approximately $4 million. 
In addition to enrollment data, we use the strategic plan to guide the development of the budget and to ensure the budget supports the needs and goals of the school division, taking into consideration the input of our stakeholders. As we go through the presentation and review expenditure increases, those that are considered mandatory, which is a statutory or contractually obligated expenditure, are notated with an asterisk. While other expenditures are deemed essential in order to continue to deliver high quality instruction and to sustain division operations at the current level. Starting with our strategic plans, goal one, academic achievement and college and career readiness. Expenditure increases here include our commitment to the New Horizons program, tuition costs for virtual Virginia for families electing virtual instruction, as well as middle school teachers based on our staffing ratios, and transitioning the site-based substitute positions from the ESSER III grant. Regarding the site-based substitute positions, this graph shows four years of data for the fill rates when a substitute accepts a daily job in a classroom due to a teacher absence. Looking at the far left for 2018, the month of September shows that the school division had a successful substitute fill rate for teacher absences of 92%, meaning 92% of the total teacher absences during the month of September 2018 were covered by a substitute. Tracking across the graph, we see a fill rate of 91% in October, 90% in November, 92% in December, 93% in January, and 89% in February, with a mean average of 90% for those months. Now, compare our current substitute fill rates for teacher absences this school year, which are denoted by the red percentage numbers of 73% in September, 69% in October, 76% in November and December, 78% in January, and 74% in February, with a mean average of 74%. We have not returned to pre-pandemic levels of substitute job fill rate percentages, but we do see a steady improvement from the previous two school years. Two reasons supporting this improvement were the implementation of the 23.5 FTEs known as the site-based substitutes and the increase of approved substitutes in the substitute pool. This is why we've recommended these positions move into the fiscal year 25 operating budget. Additional positions related to goal one include an elementary assistant principal to be shared between Norge and Matoka, as well as an elementary gifted resource teacher to expand the K-2 program. Total expenditure increases related to goal one amount to 1.3 million. Mr. Walker, Assistant Superintendent for Elementary Schools, will hear additional information related to the Assistant Principal and Gifted Resource Teacher positions. Good morning. Good morning. This chart shows our three largest elementary schools, Stonehouse, Matoica, and Norge. The number of Assistant Principal allocations, the September 30th student enrollment count, and the staffing ratios. Stonehouse Elementary has 830 students with two assistant principals, equaling a 415 to 1 ratio. Matoica has 605 students with one assistant principal, and Norwich Elementary has 575 students with one assistant principal. We currently have 10 elementary assistant principals across the nine elementary schools with 4,853 students, which equals 485 to 1 for a ratio. Our middle schools have a total of eight assistant principals with 2,692 students, equaling a 337 to 1 ratio. And our three high schools have nine assistant principals with 3,779 students, equaling a 420 to 1 ratio. Adding one additional elementary assistant principal for a total of 11 would reduce the overall elementary division ratio to 441 to 1. This additional elementary assistant principal is greatly needed and would be shared between Matoica Elementary and Norwich Elementary, supporting the current administrative duties, leadership, and the student needs of both schools. 
Though one of our local gifted plans supports the idea of elevating the thinking of all students to uncover student potential for rigorous coursework and programs such as the gifted program. The Talent Development Push-In Program has three main components. Talent Development Push-In Lessons for all kindergarten through grade two students using Harvard's Project Zero thinking routines, followed by classroom visits into all K-1 and 2 classrooms to co-teach and monitor students' needs for challenge and differentiation. The second component supports purposeful teacher collaboration and instructional planning. The final component provides differentiated instructional strategies and materials to ensure that we're challenging all students in the regular classroom. Over the last three years, we've implemented a pilot program at James River Elementary by providing two full-time gifted resource teachers at that school. One gifted teacher focuses solely on grades kindergarten to second grade, and the other gifted resource teacher focuses on the upper elementary grades. And we're seeing a direct impact on the instruction and number of identified gifted students at James River Elementary. In the spring of 2021, there were 13 students found identified gifted at James River. In the last spring of 2023, 32 students were found identified gifted. The Talent Development Push-In Program for kindergarten to second grade is also being implemented in our remaining eight elementary schools. But those eight schools share two itinerant gifted resource teachers to serve them. This means that the itinerant gifted resource teacher is only at the assigned school once a week. Thus, the program components are spread out over the course of one month. Therefore, we are requesting one more additional gifted resource teacher allocation for next school year to replicate the pilot program at James River Elementary and extend this opportunity for our youngest students into one more elementary school. Now the presentation returns. Ms. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walker. <clears throat> Goal two of the strategic plan focuses on educational equity. Expenditure increases here are for personnel to support the division's special education population. Nine of these positions are transitioning from our ESSER three grant. Dr. Brown, Senior Director for Student Services, will now share additional information related to these positions. Good morning. In order to provide context to the special education mandated needs, we will begin by looking at the special education population trends. The numbers presented here represent students receiving special education services as documented in the December 1 state reporting document, which is used to determine state and federal funding for special education for the next fiscal year. The December 1 count for this year shows, shows an increase of 123 students. This slide highlights the increasing special education population at Bright Beginnings, along with students in grades kindergarten through 12. It is important to note that the overall percentage of enrolled K through 12 students receiving services through an IEP is 15.8%. Looking at this year's data, the number of caseloads above caseload capacity maximum is at 10. These caseload numbers adjust monthly based on revised IEPs requiring increased services as well as transfer and new, newly eligible students. The trend shows that these factors will continue to impact the caseload capacity for our teachers. The Department of Special Education will continue, to monitor, exiting. will continue to monitor enrollment and caseloads through the second semester. This graph shows the five-year history of our special education expenditures and the funding source. The light green area of each column represents the amount of federal funding, which is approximately 10%. The dark blue represents the amount of state funding, which is approximately 20%. And the purple represents the amount of local funding, which is approximately 70%. For fiscal year 23, the amount of state and federal funding was 7.9 million, and the amount of local funding was 16.9 million. Special education staffing uh, needs continue to grow. This year, the equivalent of three teacher FTEs were transferred over to our operating budget from our 6B grant. Additionally, five teacher FTEs were created within our ESSER grant to support the opening of a self-contained classroom at two elementary schools and one middle school, along with the creation of a teaching position within our restorative center. Four special
special education teacher assistant positions were initially proposed in last year's preliminary budget but were maintained in the ESSER grant. Additionally, related to goal two is the transition of the four restorative center positions from the ESSER three grant to continue offering that program next year. Total expenditure increases related to goal two amount to $876,000. At this time, four additional positions originally slated to support the opening of the RESET program, which is housed under the restorative center, is not being proposed in this budget at this time. The WJCC restorative center, the newest addition to the division's non-traditional programs, began a phased-in opening during the first semester of the current school year. The refocus program, the first of two in the restorative center, provided services to 28 students who were not meeting success in their comprehensive settings due to social, emotional, or behavioral needs. Students in the refocus program remain in the program for an average of nine weeks before beginning an intentional transition back to their zone schools. These students are followed by staff from the restorative center for six to eight weeks upon the return to the conference of setting with additional support as needed. The reset program, which will house up to an additional 24 students daily who are serving short-term suspensions, is slated to open at a later date. This program will provide academic and behavioral support to students during their suspension. And at this time, I'll turn it over to Ms. Ewing. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Goal well, three of the division strategic plan is related to communication and engagement. We have included a part-time bilingual liaison specialist to support our growing population of Spanish-speaking families under this goal. Ms. Wall, strategic communications officer, will share some additional information related to this position. Thank you, and good morning. WJCC Schools currently employs one bilingual liaison specialist, Mr. Rebus. His responsibilities are wide and varied as he supports families across all levels and all needs. While the data displayed here is not meant to indicate that Mr. Rebus supports each one of these families uh, and their students, it does illustrate how the Hispanic, English learner, and students with disabilities populations have grown over recent years, which does correlate with the populations that Mr. Rebus most frequently serves. In looking at one specific function of the job instead of the population served, consider new student registrations. From the second day of school to October 23rd, 2022, WJCC schools registered 186 new students, 26 of whom identified Spanish as their home language. Over the same period in 2023, WJCC schools registered 280 students, 42 of whom identified Spanish as their home language. While the proportion of Spanish-speaking families to the whole remains roughly the same, this workload is, uh, in supporting Spanish-speaking registrants is carried by one staff member versus general registration spread across all building registrars. And registration may feel like a task typically contained to the summer and early fall, but realistically we have families moving to our division year-round. Since the week before winter break to mid-January, 22 new Spanish-speaking student registrations were processed or pending, and in February, 27 new Spanish-speaking student registrations were processed. While no two days are identical, they are always full for Mr. Rivas. In a recent three-week sample of his schedule, he averaged about 55 hours of work per week. Nearly half of this time in this three-week window was spent in meetings with students and families, and that includes IEP meetings, student support, and registration. He tallied an average of 50 daily phone calls or text interactions to support families and staff. And to meet the demand of family needs, we've brought on additional support at nine hours per week during William & Mary's academic year. Combined, the work of Mr. Rivas and our contracted support person already spanned the equivalent of one and a half positions. Adding a part-time bilingual liaison specialist is critical in continuing to meet the mandated and essential needs of our students and the community. Thank you, Ms. Wall. Uh, the safety and security of students and staff remain a priority as seen in goal four. Expenditure increases here amount to approximately 310,000. The budget proposal includes funding for a portion of the elementary school security officers with the remaining funding for the nine positions coming from approved fiscal year 22 year-end spending funds for safety and security. Also included here is a Warhill security officer that is transitioning from the SR3 grant. 
we have submitted our application for continued grant funding for the elementary school security officers but will not know until later this spring if funding this slide shares data on high school security <coughs> staffing in our surrounding school divisions Begin the slide from left to right you will see the name of the school division and total enrollment for the division the average number of security officers supporting each high school the estimated high school enrollment numbers and the ratio for security officers to students the additional FTE at our high schools would bring our ratio to 1 to 377 As a division, we continue to enhance best practice in all areas of our work, including the safety and security of our schools. We are proactive with our strategies and approach to maintaining positive school climates, and our school security officers are an essential piece of this puzzle. This position is currently funded through the ESSER III grant, and we are proposing to move it to the operating budget for the 24-25 school year. The additional FTE is currently assigned to Warhill High School, which has the largest high school population and the largest facility with 45,000 more square feet than other buildings. We do see a need to increase the FTEs over time across all high schools. This additional FTE gives us flexibility to provide security support to other schools as necessary as needs arise. In order to attract and retain high quality employees and remain competitive with neighboring divisions, the budget proposal includes an average 3% salary increase for eligible employees. Of this increase, 1% is considered mandatory in order to receive our full revenue allocation from the state as contained within the governor's budget, and the additional 2% is essential in order to remain competitive in today's job market. Funds are included within the budget proposal to support a regrade of our related service positions from a grade 19 to grade 20 on the support salary scale. This includes our speech language pathologists, occupational therapists, and physical therapists. This regrade will increase our recruitment and retention efforts for these critical staffing areas and decrease the division's reliance on utilizing contracted companies to maintain the required level of services as mandated through student IEPs. There are also funds allocated for internal equity adjustments to be considered. And I would like to note that the General Assembly budget does provide for a 3% salary increase. Additionally, the budget proposal includes targeted teacher scale adjustments as outlined on this slide at steps 10 through 30. This will be the first year of a multi-year plan to address our teacher salaries and become more competitive in the region. With these targeted scale adjustments, teachers at these steps could see an increase between 3.2% and 6%, but the average increase for all staff will be 3%. Support scale adjustments are included in the budget proposal, specifically for grades four and eight, which include bringing our minimum pay up to $14.50 per hour. And this year, we began offering the Centera plan under the local choice as an option for our employees. So we have two different rate increases for our healthcare plans. The Centera plan has a 3.4% increase, and the Anthem plans have a 9% increase. This budget proposal includes an increase in the division portion of the rate increase based on the Centera plan and sharing that increase 70% WJCC and 30% employees. Overall, the investment under Goal 5, Human Capital and Positive Culture, amounts to $5.8 million, which is essential to attract new staff as well as to retain the dedicated staff that we already have here in WJCC. The most valuable resource the school division has is our employees. These dedicated men and women go above and beyond to serve our students and community every day. The challenge is to continue to hire and retain teachers and staff members of this caliber, which is why compensation is so important. Mr. Tim Baker, Senior Director for Human Resources, will now share more information related to compensation. Morning. Morning. While we've closed the gap for starting teacher salaries, we continue to lag behind the region in milestone years. This slide shows how we compare in different milestone years on the bachelor scale for our teachers, and that we are falling farther behind the regional average, especially at the 25-year mark, where we are 5.44% below the average. 
This slide so shows how we compare on different milestone years on the master scales for our teachers, and that we're falling farther behind the regional average, especially at the 20-year mark, we are 7.29% below the average. In the 25-year mark, where we are 6.83% below the average. Statewide, the future workforce data shows that more teachers are leaving the profession while fewer teachers are becoming licensed for the first time. The number of newly licensed teachers for the 2021-2022 school year was 15% below the pre-pandemic average. The deficit between newly licensed teachers and those leaving averaged about 1,250 annually in the years preceding the pandemic. After the pandemic, though, the number of teachers leaving began to far outpace the number of newly licensed teachers. The deficit between newly licensed teachers and those leaving the profession was about 3,000 after the 2020-2021 school year, but it rose to nearly 5,500 after the 21-22 school year. Continue to see a disturbing trend while teachers resign and retire during the school year. Our goal has always been to be 100% staffed, and traditionally we've hit that mark or come very close. Our exhaustive efforts to add staff mid-year, however, is not currently keeping pace with the resignations and retirements. This year, we've seen a net increase in our total teacher vacancies each month, with a low of four in September. To 18 in January, and as of today, we stand at 21. Hiring is not currently keeping pace with resignations and retirements. Since September, we've hired 28 teachers, but we've had 33 resignations and retirements. Generally, teachers resign or retire at the end of the school year, but now this hiring season never stops and it's currently creating turmoil in our classrooms. Overall, in Virginia, the number of teachers leaving the profession rose substantially in 21-22. And by 21-22, the number of teachers leaving was 12% 12, 12 higher than the pre-pandemic yearly average. This growing gap between individuals leaving and entering the teacher profession helps explain the increase in vacant teaching positions. Before the pandemic, there were about 800 vacant teaching positions statewide. This increased substantially to about 2,800 teaching vacant positions. 3% of all the teaching positions in October 2021. More recently, the VDOE collected data from 111 divisions, and as of August 2022, finding approximately 3,300 teacher vacancies in just those 111 divisions. A 25% increase of vacancies reported in the same divisions in 2021. And this trend is also happening in WJCC schools. The latest available data that shows a 4.5% of teacher positions were reported vacant on the first day of the 2023-2024 school year. This represents a 15% increase from the prior year's vacancies rate of 3.9%. These vacancies represent a substantial increase from the previous years. Our yearly turnover trend mirrors, this, mirrors the state of Virginia. After declining during the first part of the pandemic, the number of our teacher vacancies leaving rose substantially since 2021-2022. Each licensed teacher we lose is harder to replace due to the decreasing numbers of teachers entering the profession. Look at our entry level positions, it is essential that we benchmark our wages compared to our primary competitors. On this slide, we show the minimum for our grade four, which includes our custodians, our cafeteria workers, and our bus aides. To increase grade four by $1 an hour, by $1 an hour market adjustment would take the starting rate from $13.50 to $14.50 an hour. And adding a 3% raise would bring our current staff at grade four up to a minimum of $14.94 an hour. The cost of this proposal is $2,299,705 annually for salary and benefits. For the sake of comparison, we included the starting scale information for James City County and the College of William and Mary. The information from the other organizations is current and does not reflect any potential increase for their starting wage. Slide we showed the minimum of our grade eight includes our bus drivers. The other alley comparisons are for CDL bus driving positions. 
again, for comparisons, we included the starting rate for WADA. To increase bus drivers in grade eight by $1, $1 market adjustment would bring our new minimum to $18.36 an hour. And a, an additional raise of 3% would bring the current starting staff at the minimum to $18.91 an hour, cost $142,070 annually for salary and benefits. On this slide, we are comparing examples of what a potential 3% raise would look like alongside a proposed annual increase in health care costs in our Sentara HMO plan, as well as our key advantage at $250 deductible plan with a 70-30 split based on the Sentara premium increase. We've included two teacher examples at the beginning of the pay scale and one at the midpoint of the pay scale. We've also included two examples from our support grade six employees, one at the beginning of the pay scale, one at the midpoint of the pay scale. This is a best case, worst case scenario based on health care choice. On the far left side is a step zero teacher and the range of a positive $1,551 increase if they are an employee only coverage with Sentara represented by the dark blue line above the red zero line to a negative $1,101 decrease if they've chosen Anthem $250 deductible plan for an entire family plan represented by the light blue line. The salary range would be from $1,551 to negative $1,001 for a step zero teacher while it would range for positive $2,211 to negative $441 for a step 14 teacher. The salary change for an entry grade level six employee would range from positive $478 to negative $2,174 and for a midpoint grade six employee would be from a positive $636 to a negative $2,016. On this slide, we look at a potential 4% raise with that same 70-30 split. And the salary change would range from $2,071 to a negative $581 for a step zero teacher while it would range from $3,342 to $690 for a step 14 teacher. The salary change for an entry level grade six employee would range between $678 to negative $1,974 for a midpoint grade six employee for an entry level employee and then for a midpoint employee for grade six would range from $884 to a negative $1,068. Last slide is potential 5% raise with the same 70-30 split for health care. The salary range would be from $2,016 to a negative $36 for a step zero teacher while it would range from $3,954 to $1,302 for a step 14 teacher. Salary change for an entry grade level six employee would range between $871 and to negative $781 for a midpoint grade six employee would be $1,128 to a negative $1,524. Back to Ms. Ewing. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Moving on to budgetary expenditures related to goal six, organizational efficiency and effectiveness. You will see funding to support anticipated increases in our workers' compensation and general liability insurance as well as cost increases for our audit and risk management contract. Specific increases related to operations and transportation under goal six include anticipated increases in our grounds maintenance and storage facility contracts, utilities, the transportation contract for alternative transportation services, as well as the elementary trailer leases. Total expenditure increases under goal six are $1.4 million. Related to goal six, organizational efficiency, we have estimated savings of $1.4 million as represented on this slide in order to offset some of the expenditure increases. 
Um, those are made out, we have reviewed our elementary teacher allocation for the current year, which is budgeted at 245 FTEs, but we currently only utilize 243 FTEs. So we will reduce next year's allocation by two in order to support the increase for middle school that we mentioned earlier in the presentation. Reserve positions are used to address increased enrollment if we have more students than we budgeted for. And we are reducing these positions from five in the current budget to two for next year. Bus driver and bus aid positions are being reduced based on currently budgeted positions that have remained vacant over the past two years. We are reducing these FTEs in order to support the continuation of the transportation services contract. Lastly, we analyzed the funds remaining in central office department budgets for the previous three years and reduced each department by 30% of the average of funds remaining. This graphic outlines that our focus is right where it should be, instruction. It represents our expenditures by functional area and instruction makes up 73% of our total budget. In summary, our revenue increase, which is based on the governor's proposed amendment or proposed budget, and a small increase in our interest revenue is approximately $207,000. The expenditure increases amount to approximately $8.3 million, which results in a funding request to the localities of approximately $8.1 million, which is a net increase of 7.9% over the current fiscal year. The school board will vote on the fiscal year 25 budget on Tuesday and are considering some adjustments to the superintendent's proposed budget. Those adjustments being considered include increasing the bilingual language specialist to full time with an additional cost of 45,000. Um, another adjustment being considered is increasing salaries from 3% to a higher percentage, possibly between four and 5%, as well as a possible change to healthcare costs. This slide shows the impact of these changes on the request to the localities, which could range from 9.3 million to 10.5 million. Lastly, while we do not have a budget calc tool for the General Assembly's budget, as I mentioned earlier, preliminary estimates have been provided to divisions, and it's possible we may get an additional 4 million in state funding. Some of the items included in that budget are a 3% salary increase, revised at-risk funding formula, revised staffing standards for English language learners, and restoring the grocery tax hold harmless funds. Additional state funding would reduce the amount requested of the localities. That concludes our formal presentation of the superintendent's proposed budget, and we'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. I remember around this time last year, uh, this is the period where teachers are asked to provide retention, um, forecasting if they're staying or if they're not staying. And, um, I think around now, we just toured Berkeley Middle School, there's some idea of what teacher retention looks like next year. Berkeley at least looks very successful. Could you address, Dr. Aaron, the teacher retention as it's forecasted for next year from those surveys? Mr. Baker to, to join us at the podium because they all those that information is back in DHR. We do the survey every year. We try to reach out to those teachers who are still undecided and have principals speak with them so we have a really good idea of who's staying and who's not. Mr. So Baker, do you have an updated information? I think it's trending like it has in the recent past, more like in the 85% range. It, from my experience, usually after spring break, a lot of people change their decision to make different decisions. So it's trending about 85%. Which is normal. Which is normal. I mean, it's, we wish it would be better, but it's it's the tip of last year, so. Thank you, Mr. Baker. While you're at the podium, if you may, help, help us understand, it may be obvious to some, but why are teachers retiring um, at such a high rate? I think it's a, a mix of a lot of things. Some of it's uh, your question about retiring. Some folks uh, are retired because they've had their 30 years. Some folks are exiting the system 
um, for they're moving, relocating. Some are going next door for more money. Um, it's it's a it's a mix. Uh, but we do have teachers that are leaving us for to go to Newport News, or we have teachers that are moving because uh, their spouse is in the military and they're moving to you know, different parts of the country. I think one of the slides you showed that our trend is is similar to the trend in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Yes, sir. So there's, I guess it would be a shift of teachers going from one district and then some coming to ours. Or and I think you, um, we haven't seen as much of that uh, as folks you know, coming to us per, per, per se, but we do have folks who relocate here, or some folks who are willing to come here, live in the community, um, and they have that desire to be here. I think part of the issue as well, there's a, a, a teacher population is not getting younger, it's getting older, and the, the lack of new uh, people coming into the profession, as you saw today, is, is really challenging because there's not as many coming in. I do know we've reached out already, and every single student teacher who taught with us uh, over the last year has been offered a contract, and many have accepted already. Uh, Mr. Baker, do you have some sense of employed already for next year? I had early offers for like I think over 35 uh, teachers except uh, some they don't know the exact even classroom location or position that they're willing to take like Dr. Heron mentioned we, we offered every William and Mary student teacher of ours a, a, a contract in, in the, during the winter uh, knowing that we anticipate that those trends that we uh, hired over you know any teachers the last few years and we know we'll get to that and back to kind of your point of you know so far only you know 40 or 50 have announced that they're not coming back for next year but just from our experience we know it's going to end up probably more like at least 150. As we do analysis of every position every grade level we anticipate potential vacancies but we stretch out ahead of that because of our current environment and hire everybody we can. Right. I understand that based on what I'm hearing is that we're losing more than than other divisions. Is that attributable solely to the compensation or are there other factors that you're hearing from teachers that are leaving? I mean, it's, it's, it's compensation, but it's also other factors. I think some people are leaving K-12 in, in general across the country, across the Commonwealth. There's folks that are, um, it's a challenging position. Um, and so, then, and, and like Dr. Heron mentioned, there's less and less folks coming into it. So the applicant pool is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And, and we're having to hire more people that are career changers that maybe I have a degree in, in history and now I'm going to become, become a teacher. Um, so it's, it's less and less. Look, there's less choice for us. So we've actively uh, working with teacher assistants who are doing an excellent job in our classroom. And we've got uh, a program just been just recently called I Teach, where it gives a TA the opportunity to do some classes to become qualified as a, as a teacher. And we brought on many TAs last year, especially in special ed, and we can speak to that and just give a sense that we're actually trying to transition really good people into the profession internally from teacher assistant to teacher and have been very successful in doing that. I think like approximately a dozen or so employees, like Dr. Heron mentioned, that were in other positions if they were teacher assistants or substitutes, but they had a degree. Uh, I, as an HR person, I really like that because they have that realistic job preview of they know what it's like to be in the classroom and realize, okay, this is, this is hard, uh, but they still want to do it. And so we'll help them and we'll support them. Now that at the state level there are more resources in terms of teacher licensing to help kind of streamline that process um, to hopefully help us and help other uh, divisions across the Commonwealth. That's working really well and we're even looking at a potential <clears throat> mid-range like a position that's an associate teacher. So you move from TA into on a provisional license you become an associate teacher once you're fully qualified you move up to the actual full teacher pay. And so we've been creative in trying to, to meet the need internally. And we're also trying to get teacher assistance from other systems because we now have this special program in place for them. Thank you. Uh, I, I think maybe I, I have a couple of questions um, relating to uh, HR. Uh, would mind. Um, obviously, when you look at the, the figures on health insurance, uh, um, they are a challenge for, for teachers. Uh, they are 
um, really um, college for uh, the support staff. Uh, where it looks from what, what you were showing that uh, for for most support staff folks, uh, there may be a, a negative consequence of, of even um, the rate, a 3% raise. Correct. And so what we're trying to show there was, um, I didn't quite call it um, their take home pay because they may have other factors like retirement or other other benefits, but the change in their pay, if they take uh, well, like a 3% raise, if they take the highest deductible, the, I mean, the, the, the $250 deductible family plan, which, which costs the most, um, that increase would be so significant that their net change in their pay next year would be negative, even with the 3% pay rates. Um, and that's what we emphasize about, about choice. And so we, this year we did bring on the HMO from Centera, uh, was the first year. So there, that was the, the, the top bar, the dark blue bar in the chart where it would have, uh, if you were only covering yourself and with the HMO, then, uh, your net change to your pay would be more beneficial to you. And I, I'm just curious about the question of, of whether um, uh, there is a much utilization of the health benefit uh, among the support staff. Yeah, about 70% of our employees, and I think it's pretty well distributed even amongst the support staff, take our health insurance. Many folks work almost exclusively for the health insurance, um, about 70%. And do you happen to know whether there are other options available to um, uh, employees uh, and, and whether they, um, there's any effort to sort of provide information about uh, the possibility of uh, you know, covering children, for instance, uh, through Medic uh, Medicaid uh, and, and the like? Um, for us, I mean, we don't share that part of the information for their own personal. For us, we have the products that from the Anthem product and then also the, the Sentara HMO product that we share with our employees. Mr. Lennon, if I may, I just want to stress that the, the school board has also recognized that issue that you're pointing out on the slides and we are considering other adjustments. I don't want to get ahead of the board because our meeting is on Tuesday, but what we have taken note of, the same thing you're taking note of, and, and we'll likely make some adjustments in that area. One of those adjustments is potentially looking, we built our, our average cost to employees of a new plan, which was our Sentara plan, which is much less expensive, and we're actually going back to look at it based on our, our deduct 500 deduction plan, and that actually impacts the amount each employee would pay towards the plan, but it costs about um, 600000 to do that. But when we do that, it actually moves all of those lines up a little bit towards the middle. And I think one of the one of the major things, the new plan we introduced last year is very effective. It's an HMO, but it's a it's an HMO without a gatekeeper. And and about 100 employees moved to that plan and have found it to be very good. And so we're starting to, on a, an education uh, piece with, with every employee to make them aware of the value of that plan that costs much less. And if an employee chooses that, Obviously, there's, there's more take-home pay with still a lot of very good health benefits. Uh, we did do a survey of all staff um, very recently. We do it, we've done it for the last two years. Do you want to put the money into salary or do you want to put it into health care? Uh, overwhelmingly, it's been salary, and so our, our philosophy generally has been give more in salary and then let the employee make the choice of the level of plan that we're offering you. So we're trying to, to really go from every angle. Uh, the one other question I had was about uh, special education funding. Um, has there been much of an effort to uh, um, address the uh, relative uh, share of funding carried by the state rel uh, compared to localities? And, and uh, the uh, uh, federal government obviously said they were going to handle all this and, and <laughs> to live up to that commitment. But, uh, when we think about uh, um, the reputation that, that I think our school system has very deservedly for providing excellent services in, in special education, we seem to be uh, somewhat of a magnet, which is you know important uh, to be able to provide those services. Um, but uh, I'm curious as to whether there's any any way in which we can sort of bring leverage to the state to say basically you know. Uh, 
um, may need to step up and take on a, a greater share of the uh, the services. Yeah, Mr. Wigland, I think I think it should be an area that we should all get behind next year because obviously 70% of our special education funding, as Dr. Brown presented this morning, is from the locality. There's a lack of federal funds, there's a lack of state funds, and the increase in that budget is, is increasing every, every single year. And I think, Dr. Brown, you presented even our state funds are title funds, we are, they're, they're used up completely and now some of those positions are coming into the operating budget because the grant funds are not there. Do you want to speak to that? Yes, yeah, so we see the sort of stagnation of the federal funding um, that we get each year through the annual plan. Uh, we are finding that we're having to move and uh, all of those funds are used to support special education staff salaries and benefits. So as salary and benefits increase and the, the funding stays the same, we're having to move a lot of our funding into our operating fund and it's a burden on the locality. Um, any chance we get, we, we advocate at the state and uh, federal level uh, and also through efforts like through our SEAC. We often talk about advocacy at the at the state and federal level at any chance we can get to, to help increase the funding we receive because we are rightfully so obligated to provide services to anyone in our locality. So any increased funding from state and federal view very much welcome. So. Thank you. I think um, what we're seeing here is the same thing we're seeing in James City County and the same thing Williamsburg seeing and, and the city and, and the business communities are seeing the exact same thing, trying to find people, trying to figure out how we're going to keep them, what we're going to do. And I think our biggest thing would be, as we're all struggling to go through this because, you know, the top line, James City County, would be about nine million <clears throat> all the funding for to come out. We thought it was about seven million. Today we're looking at if we go to the top line of everything, we're looking at about nine million our line share of it. And um, so, you know, with that, how do we do everything we're doing in James City County? And we just had an increase in, or maybe an increase in revenue for the assessments because that all went up as well. And so we're getting pressure from the citizens as well as going, you know, you went up 21%, you went up 67%, but on average it's 21. And some of them went up higher, some of them were 15, 12, and that sort of thing. So, but we're getting pressure from the, the I think our biggest thing is, and I'm, I've seen it in the past where groups get in between us. We're all looking for the same thing. How do we keep our employees? How do we pay them what we need to pay them? How do we have the benefits in place? But also, how do we keep the taxes within a reason so we're not killing our residents out there at the same time? And that's a balancing act. And most of the time, we'll get groups that will come in between our groups, the three groups here. And um, you're not doing this for the teachers. And you're not doing this for this. And, and I don't think there's anybody in here that's not trying to do something and trying to move this needle further for the teachers and the children and the instruction and our employees in the city, our employees in the county. And so we're all at a, you know, tightening our belt, trying to figure out how do we cover all these. And more likely we're not gonna be able to cover everything. But I think it's our message from the three localities as far as how we present this message out, as far as what we can do and what we may not be able to do. And you know, it's a tough thing. Would you like to pay people everything that they need? To, yeah, that, that'd be, you know, a wonderful world to live in. And um, But the other side is, you know, at the same time, I'm giving you a raise, but I'm raising your taxes at home as well. And like the insurance, um, you know, the, the health insurance to me is a benefit. It's kind of looking like it's not a benefit, but it's a, it's a weight on the teachers. I look at it as a benefit, not a weight. You know, it's the same thing if we were to bring a chart up and compare the house you built or bought compared to what you're making as a teacher. You know, that's going to throw that thing off as well. I think the um, any health insurance we can work with and offer and, and try to make savings, which we do in the county as well. And uh, we've dropped ours down as much as we can, but still trying to cover as, as much as we can cover on the employees benefits and what they pick so i think that's a item there but i always look at health insurance 
working in the private field, I know what health insurance costs when you're not a big group. And it is a huge benefit. And if somebody doesn't think it is, if they go out in, into the private sector where there may not be, they find out the cost of that. So I, I, I'm glad we offer that. I'm glad we're able to give that to our employees and our teachers and all that. But it is a big benefit. And it's one of those things we need to put in the benefit side of, yeah, it costs. And we know it costs. And all of us are paying that. But it is on the benefit side of the package as well. Thank you. Well, I think one of the key things last year was introducing a plan that was very good that cost less and so we do believe that will help our employees over time and, and thankfully the state is coming through with we think about four million so it will bring that nine and ten right down to six something which is much more realistic and so we're just pleased that the General Assembly has come through to support public, public education. On, on a personal note, I, I love my new assessment because I know it's going to work towards public education. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Spread the word. Absolutely. Put her on tape. I think that, that does really uh, create a, a, an opportunity for us to start communicating with the General Assembly uh, and the Governor about the importance of uh, making <coughs> this down payment on the short vault that JLARC uh, recognized last year. Um, so uh, uh, this is the, the budget approved by the General Assembly uh, really does recognize uh, the need to make a much more significant investment in education. Uh, so I hope we will uh, take the opportunity not only for us to, to uh, express uh, support for that uh, kind of funding, uh, but also to encourage our uh, constituents um, who uh, are concerned about the rate of, of uh, uh, increasing their local taxes, uh, uh, that this would, would be something that could help to moderate that. So I just I just had a one question. You mentioned the um, house side uh, was a three percent increase. Um, of which are they are they funding that entire three percent, or are they coming back to the locality to fund half of that? So in the the general assembly budget right now, there is a three percent raise for, for SOQ positions only. SOQ positions, and as always, being locality that's a higher LCI, the significant amount of that will of course fall upon the locality. If we don't give at least the three percent, then we leave money on the table because you can only get the 3% from the General Assembly for SOQ positions if you get 3%. And so so that's always a, an ambiguous place to be because we don't want to leave any state money sitting on the table. So, and how many SOQ positions do you have? That's a good question. <laughs> um, and then a total number of positions. I'll to give Renee a few minutes to look up her binder here on that one. No, that she can... We, we, can get, we can get that for you. Um, There's a significant number of positions that are not SOQ funded, even with regard to teacher assistance. I think in our joint advocacy last year, I think we worked out it was about, I remember, do you remember any of those dates, those numbers on PAs from last year as well? I believe it was about 100. About 100 positions not funded, something like that. So so we can we can re review those numbers again because our locality funds a lot. And, and that is the reason we have the system we have. We're very, very grateful for it. So that would be if you did 3% and knowing that your school board may come back with a different compensation number, but on those non-SOQ positions, the localities would then be giving 6%. Correct. That's my right. Okay. So, um, and then just a comment going back to both um, Mr. Hipple and Mr. McGlennon. Um, we are getting a lot of heat for the assessments and um, we know on our side that you know we're looking at substantial compensation as well if you all come back with the budget which I know there will be a lot of discussion between but but we're going to need some backup um, you know not when you're talking with your neighbors and, and that are upset about um, the assessments <coughs> you know what percentage of that money goes to Towards your budget, I would really appreciate it if you would, 
you know, back up the need for that. Um, because what what I have said in what, uh, the emails that we are getting, which relatively speaking for the number of homes that we have, we have not heard from a huge percentage of people because I think they, they do realize. But what I have said on my last line is, this is the time for us to decide how much we value the people that work for James City County every day for our citizens, and we value the employees of our school system because we know that that is where the two chunks of our money are going to go. So I've tried to talk about how we value our, you know, it's, it's up to our citizenry to decide how much they value those um, those people and their positions. So. Other questions or comments? Well, thank you all for listening to the presentation and for being here and for asking very thoughtful questions. Um, and with that, meeting of the Williamsburg James City County School Board is adjourned.